So hello everybody and welcome to this episode of CFO 4.0. Now I'm quite excited to have a, um, a repeat offender, um, a Patrick Dunn who's been on the podcast before. This time he's coming back to talk about a really interesting article that he wrote that I loved all about the, the shift from a maps to a sat nav wor- world in terms of how the way that boards make decisions. So welcome back, Patrick. Lovely to have you back. And great, great to be back and lovely to see how it's been developing at CFO 4. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It was, it's been a really interesting, so it's been quite a few months since you've been on the, on the show. So for those perhaps that haven't looked through or listened back to the back catalogue of CFO 4.0, if you haven't, you really should listen to a previous um, episode that Patrick did with us on what boards are looking for in a CFO. Um, but just tell us a little bit about because you um, yourself, Patrick, in terms of your you know your book that you've um, you've got out and um, you I, I must admit I have read and it's very good. So uh, yeah, it'd be great to understand sort of a bit about your background for those that perhaps haven't listened to a previous episode. Yeah, so so very briefly, I'm sort of born in inner city Liverpool. Um, was okay at maths, did a maths degree worked in the chemicals industry, then got an MBA, then got into private equity before it was fashionable, um, ended up on the operating committee of, of 3i, uh, FTSE 100, um, and got really interested in boards during that time. Uh, and on the side of my day job, I've, I've built a number of um, social enterprises uh, here and in, uh, and in Africa, mostly around disadvantaged young people and, uh, and education or, or getting... Uh, young people from those backgrounds to to get quality jobs. Yes, and when did you publish? So you've written a book, obviously, on how well functioning boards operate, because there's not there's not a huge amount on the topic. So um, t- tell us a little bit about that book and how long ago did you actually publish it? Yeah, so actually, the what what's just been published is the second edition of a book called Boards, and Boards I, I published literally a fortnight before the pandemic broke. So there was nothing in boards about uh, the crisis, the pandemic, COVID, you know, all of those things. And it struck me fairly on, just because I chair a number of boards, um, that things were changing profoundly. Some things were changing anyway, and they just got a boost by COVID. Um, other things, you know, just, just people's mindsets changed and, and things changed as well. And the way we work together changed because hybrid or virtual virtual working so i thought i'm whereas originally i thought you know well maybe do a new edition in three or four years i thought actually it's probably going to be sooner than that but i didn't want to do it too quickly because then you know <laughs> things might change again significantly so i better wait a bit um and so i literally uh, the, the book has got uh, sort of four sections if you like so uh, the first three are purpose, people and process, because I found in terms of board effectiveness, if you've got the right purpose, you've got people clear about that, you're all aligned behind that, that's good. If you then got the right people working together in the right way and you've got good, relevant process for the nature of the organisation and the stage of its development, then that's quite a good model for board effectiveness. So so I went through, those were the sort of first three sections, if you like, and then the fourth section, which is probably half the book, are a whole series of dilemmas and difficult situations that you might face as a director. And, and then there's a sort of, how do you navigate your way through through this? So in looking at doing the new edition for how it might be impacted by COVID, I literally went, rather than do a COVID chapter, which would have been the easiest thing, could have knocked that out quite quickly. I went through every sentence, literally, to see, has that changed? Has this changed? Is that the same? That, and... and um, and that's where I thought the way we make decisions was probably one of the biggest things that was shifting. And I think it was shifting beforehand, but it but it got a boost. And there were a couple of others, but and, and I was sitting in my car um, being diverted somewhere one day. And I was thinking, actually, we, we seem to be moving to a sat-nav world in terms of the way we're making decisions closer to the junction um, <laughs> with better information about the re- what the rest of the world is doing rather than, you know, just we, we started out, we knew where we wanted to get to, we had a map and we're following it. We get lost and we go again on that. But we weren't sort of adapting our route as quickly as we might for the conditions that were facing us. So that was where the analogy 
came from. And uh, I, I did a little three minute video in my car actually about it too, which was quite fun. <laughs> um, but um, but I think uh, you know um, more seriously that there are a number of clear drivers around this, and maybe we'll talk about those in a minute. And I think there's a dream of, of involved in this is that we will make better decisions. And there's a reality that it's not quite as straightforward to shift from a Max world to a sat nav world, especially for CFOs, um, as it as it might seem. No, absolutely. And I think we'll um we'll we'll pick up on some of those challenges as we go through. So if if we if we sort of sum if I maybe summarize what you've just said there. So so what we're saying is is basically the pace of decision making has changed and the, the speed at which we're reacting has changed. Um, but, um, COVID's a great um, accelerator in those, and I guess, great illustrator of that scenario. So you you also made a really interesting comment was that this was actually happening before the pandemic. So, you know, tell us a little bit about that. You know, what what is changing? What is causing that shift? So the, I think in the venture capital area, early stage businesses, you know, people have been doing this for decades. So you have lockstep approaches to spending. So you're only going to spend when this has happened and so on. You have strategic frameworks and parameters instead of a detailed strategic Bible. So those things were already there, I think. Um, and uh, the, the the pandemic has just, just accelerated, accelerated that. I think just as it can be challenging for finance directors, it can also be challenging for board members who, you know, their whole lives they've been driven by, you know, let's agree the budget, let's agree the plan, let them get on with it, challenge it, and then that's it. Whereas, you know, const- more, more constant review, if you like, is a bit more, more hard work uh, and, and greater uncertainty and with bigger stakes for getting it right or wrong. Um, you know, that introduces more pressure into things, which, which is, can be very helpful and it can be unhelpful. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because it's not like you say it's not only the 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 ability to make the change and the wish to make the change is actually a requirement to make the change quicker because like you say the world is changing. I don't know well, I don't know how many people had um, a pandemic on their business continuity plan before the the crisis, but I'm pretty sure they've all got it on now. To be very fair, true, and I think people have changed their approach to risk. I think. We lived in a just-in-time world before, and now we're in a just-in-case world. <laughs> and I think a lot of risk matrices now have got more about consequences than they have about events. So I was very struck, because I chair the EY Foundation, how swiftly EY moved to virtual working. It's like in a day. Uh, and it was because in the crisis uh, contingency planning, there, were, there was a, what would happen if we couldn't get into our offices, all of them? On, on the day and they had a plan for that didn't didn't have a plan for what will happen if covid19 strikes but they had a plan for that and i think a lot of people have shifted to more of a consequences than an events type approach to, to to looking at risk that's an interesting one and if we get time on this podcast i might pick your brains on that a little bit more you know but back onto the topic and sort of where we started the conversation so um, talk to me about the the, the decision making process in terms of how are boards and or senior leadership team now approaching decision making? Has the actual process of decision making changed, or is it just the speed? I think the process has changed, and I think actually some decisions are made later, just as they are when you're in your car or your boat. You know, you you kind of making the decision closer to the junction as opposed to all of the decisions when you set out. So the way that it's changing, I think, is that boards and exec teams are agreeing the strategic framework, the parameters, agreeing the objectives where you want to go, and then applying um, flexibility in between. And one of the ways they're doing that is, is to say, we just did this last week, actually, again at the UI Foundation, where we looked at what are the five or six big decisions we've got to make in the coming year? When do we need to make them? How are we going to make them? And we make some decisions in a different way to others. Rather than make every decision in the same way, team do a paper, present it to the board, board kick the tyres, tweak a bit, go ahead. We're saying, actually, let's break this down. So we have an, we, we break the big decisions 
we break down into three. So we have a, an early discussion where we're exploring all the issues, getting our heads around the different choices we might have, we might be interested in making. Second one, really narrowing down those choices. That's the mid. So if you take an early, mid, later approach, this is the mid bit, and you're getting a much greater understanding of that choice. And then the, the late, which is the final bit, we're actually, yep, yeah, we are going ahead with that choice. But in the final one, you're spending a greater amount of time, and I think was historic, on understanding the implementation plan. Because when you look at most decisions that go wrong, it's often not because you made the wrong choice. You just did it badly. You executed badly. You picked the wrong person to lead it, the wrong partner. You didn't have enough contingency. You didn't apply enough resource. You thought it would happen much more quickly. And so by doing that early, mid, late approach, and being clear what are the big decisions you've got to take and dealing with those sort of in, mo- in terms of the priority most important first, then I, th- I think that's been quite a big shift. And then when it comes to the decision, I think there's greater flexibility in the execution in in a lot of ways because there's an understanding that, um, you know, uh, things, things change. So, for example, this is as much about the upside as the downside. So if you were Zoom and you were a Zoom board at the beginning of the pandemic, you, you you know you had a budget, you had a plan, and you could have just stuck to that and you'd have done well. But actually, the smart thing was to say, hold on a minute, things have changed significantly. We don't know how long for. So we'll put in process a more regular review and we're going to massively up spending if you know sales, customer numbers come through more strongly, then we will do that. So I think it's more in an if-then mindset than a January or February mindset. Whereas before, you know, people say, well, this is what we're going to spend in January or you get to the end of the year, you haven't spent your budget and you think, well, I better spend it, otherwise it won't give me the same next year. It sort of blows that away a bit, uh, which I think is healthy. And so it's almost like, like you say, contingency planning. If this happens, then we're going to allocate this kind of resource. So how do you manage all of those various different scenarios on top of trying to keep control, I guess, of your, your ongoing costs and budgets? You know, how, how can you structure those, those controls and those scenarios in a way that works? And that's where, you know, really smart CFOs and CEOs together because there's the financial side and there's the operational side. So one of the, the you know, management teams love the idea of more flexibility, but they also have a high need for certainty. Will I be able to recruit those people? And you, you're saying, well, yeah, if the sales come in that way or the cash is, is this, um, and no, if not. <laughs> um, and, and they find that less comfortable, obviously. So I think there's a, there's a trade to be done on both sides, really, between the board and the exec. And I think it's only by talking about it, only by agreeing how we're going to make these decisions that you get that. But certainly, I I think in the case of um, ESSA, Charter Management Institute, EY Foundation, um, you know, boards, I'm on our chair, we did that and, and happily that 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 proved to, to be very helpful in terms of the way we we changed the way we worked together. Um, it was it was really really helpful. So if we just step back for a second then and think about what are the things so a, a new board wanting to approach this more dynamic approach to decision making, what do they actually need to have in place, and how should they approach it? If you, if you were approaching a new board, perhaps without any of this in place what were the what would the what would be the process that you would go through with them so we would be thinking about what are the big decisions that we 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 know that we have to take what are the decisions that we think we might have to take you've got those what is the nature of those decisions and how fundamental are they to our strategy and to our operating model and then um, to start thinking about, okay, when is when might be the best time to make that decision from what we know today, and what information would we ideally have to be able to make that decision? So, for example, we'd want to know about what the competitors are up to, what the regulator might be thinking about this issue, 
uh, if we do this, will that uh, improve or deteriorate staff engagement? For example, what impact will this have on the local communities if we decide to? So what, what bits of information do we need to have? Uh, some of those won't be changing very quickly. Some of them might be. So we might actually decide in order to make this decision in um, January, uh, you know, we need this sort of financial analysis, we need this sort of market analysis, we need this um, risk analysis, whatever. And we, we, we get going on the work for that. And then the next sort of meeting we have, we're saying, OK, yeah, so we, we really we really are going to make that decision then. And, you know, we need to fine tune this information and we start to get into it. And then we uh, then we go and make the decision at the at the right point. So it's a it's a sort of rather than the historical thing where we 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 say we need to make a decision on X. Management come and give us a paper a week before, and we decide to do it, yay or nay, or tweak it a little bit and do it. Um, we're not doing that. Um, we're actually thinking harder about how can we how do we stand the best chance of making this decision right. So it sounds like there's there's firstly a bit more prep involved in terms of thinking, trying to think ahead. It's almost like you're trying to predict the decisions that you might need to make in the future um, and then almost identifying requirements in order to make that decision and dependencies before you even get presented with the paper itself. Yeah, I mean, a, a very good example pre-pandemic was um, the universities of Warwick's approach to Brexit. So... Warwick has this early mid late approach to making big decisions and also the what are the big decisions we might need to take. And by coincidence, the meeting that we had um, to discuss, you know, what are the next big decisions just before that, there was sort of rumour that there might be uh, a Brexit referendum. Uh, and we said, actually, well, if there is, then that could be a massively significant event. Seems like a low probability there, doesn't it? Uh, but the impact is very high. So why don't we, in our next board meeting, spend some time just thinking through what are the issues if we did leave the EU? And, uh, you know, those might be in terms of students, faculty, research income, sorts of things. Um, and when might we need to decide something just in case it happens? So the best example I can think of is so if you have a, an EU faculty retention strategy, so we want to keep as many of our European faculty as we can, there's no point waiting till you get to the referendum decision and do something about it the next morning. That's something you need to start now. But there'd be other things, like we maybe need some new partnerships in Europe. We maybe we, we could lose a, a terrific amount of research income, which most universities have as a result of leaving the, the EU. How are we? What are we going to do about that? And that will take longer. So we had a combination of there's a big decision. What do we do about Brexit if it happens? And then there's a series of other things and they're on different timelines. So we could quite quickly come up with an EU faculty retention strategy and approve that, you know, in two meetings time and get on with doing that. And then actually, whether there was Brexit or not, that would be not a bad thing. We didn't have, it didn't cost much, a lot of money. There'll be other things like losing, you know, a lot of research income, which could have a more profound effect. And in terms, I guess then, so what are you expecting from a CFO as part of this shift? Is there a change in what they're, how they are required to work with the board? How, you know, what sort of things should they be considering in terms of um, themselves, both as an individual, but also their departments and their teams as well? I, I think the uh, what's already happened is I think actually a lot of smart CFOs have anticipated this and already been thinking about these things. And this is the environment that's then given them almost a mandate to do it. So <clears throat> I think they've, they've kind of, for a while, many of the CFOs I know think that the rigidity of an annual budget, it, it, it's a bit of an odd thing, isn't it, to, to think in, mon in months rather than sort of, you know, what condition the company might be in at a point where you start to spend more money or less. So I think they've been there before. The, the smarter ones also are very on top of, it's not just financial information that drives the performance of the company. And they've got a, a, a 
visibility. Many of them are all, all, also often responsible for digital um, and, and, and other things. Uh, so they've got to know uh, the system, they system think, if you like. So they're not just thinking about the P&L, the balance sheet and um, the cash flow. They're, they're thinking about the system, the financial dynamic, for want of a better word. So they think about the financial dynamic, the operational dynamic and the strategic dynamic. And they kind of got that overview of those things. And they're recruiting people who, you know, are uh, agile, are kind of can cope with doing a different job. Um, are, are actively open-minded, thinking about different ways to do things, challenging the, you know, whatever is the way it's done now in, in, a, in a constructive way. So uh, I think they're leaders, basically, is, is the word I'd use. They're, they're sort of thinking ahead. They're most picking the right people, motivating them, and they're able to um, uh, influence the board and the other execs to, to work in that way. Because I'm guessing you need a, a strong support from that CFO to shift into that dynamic model because of the the changes it's going to require on a you know on a board by board basis in terms of each board meeting it, the the situation could be very different. Very dangerous to embark down this route if you haven't got a CFO who is um, got the potential or the capability and uh, and and wants to. Mm. Um, because you can then see the whole thing not you know just be so you know from a board point of view obviously you may need to think about do you need to change the cfo before you embark on this um because you know for whatever reason that's not their way of doing things or they they don't have those skills or uh they just don't want to do it um you know as with any other role you know um that that concept of an agile finance function, I think, is quite an interesting one, and it, it's certainly coming into play. I'm seeing it talked about a lot more, you know, across both systems, but also, and now I'm hearing it strategically as well, which is quite interesting in terms of how boards are moving. Um, and and I guess that's the question a lot of our listeners need to ask themselves, isn't it? Are you are you able to to perform that function for your board and for your team? And are they? I guess also are they aware that you can? Have you got plans in place um, to to be able to cope with the dynamic situations? And and do you have access to the right information and data? And like you say, it comes back to that conversation, I guess, about finance in context, isn't it? So that operational conversation so oh. no I was just going to say it's, it's quite an interesting dynamic and and certainly are you having those conversations with the CFOs for the for the the boards that you're chairing completely yeah and we we well I mean I suppose I was lucky because I I spent you know a big chunk of my early career in in venture and private equity um that's the way that operates uh, so that was it's sort of more natural if you like um, and so yeah and at the beginning of the pandemic what was interesting is all the boards I'm on we we, we had a conversation about how are we going to work together and what what does this mean for the way we make strategic decisions the way we do budgeting you know and we, we sort of had budgets for phases as opposed to months so while these conditions um, uh, continue then this is what we're going to do when you know when we're released into the community <laughs> or whatever it might be you know <laughs> then we we might do something different um or if we see a spike in demand that we hadn't anticipated which is quite a lot of companies did um because people's spending patterns shifted quite dramatically during lockdown um you know up as well as down you know you look at the stuff that we're using to do this today you know so many people invested in you know better cameras for their laptop or better microphones or headsets or you know um, all sorts of things that, that people wouldn't have naturally anticipated um, but will that continue once everyone's got one of those <laughs> so, yeah. it's it's an interesting thing and just something I, I think is quite an interesting point because like you say you're having to manage multiple budgets for multiple scenarios so actually the workload in terms of the amount of budgets that you've got to produce could be, you know, could, you know, double, triple, 
you know, quadruple, depending on how many scenarios that you're catering for. So are there any strategies that you've got in place to, to cope with that as a, as a budget, as a board? I think, I mean, obviously as a board, you're interested in, you know, the, the aggregate, you know, in a way. You'll interrogate below that, but you're interested in the aggregate. So one of the things the CFO has to have in mind is the, what's the combination of things that we've agreed to and the consequences of that. So one of the things, you know, you, you've seen lots of CFOs in board meetings will now, whereas before they tended not to, they may have their laptop there and they say, actually, yeah, if we do that, this is what will happen. The combination of the things that you've just decided will result in this. So they've sort of, mod. there was one company uh, about two months into the pandemic I, I was working with, and they, you know, the CFO would, would always bring his laptop and he'd say yeah well if you want to do that this is how that's going to play out in the p l cash flow and the budget and the uh, balance sheet and doing it then rather than then will have an impact in six months time of this or or, or so on and 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 he he was extremely good and able to just put in straight away you know well yeah you do that 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 this is what because sometimes the it's hard as a an exec to carry the aggregate in your head of all the consequences and that then the you know he was able to play out so i remember one conversation he had and yeah all those three things make absolute commercial sense but they're going to blow our banking covenants in december <laughs> so you know they make they make commercial sense other than the fact that you know you're in trouble with the bank um but from a you know ROI point of view and those sort of things fine so I think finance directors are are building better financial dynamic models now um, uh, as a consequence of this and and, and are more confident with the tech and with uh, their models that they can say yeah you know this is what's going to happen I think that's a really interesting visual, isn't it? That sort of anticipatory CFO, the one that's able to sort of sit there with their, with their dashboards, with their models and respond to the situation. And But again, it comes back to that, like, have you got the systems and processes in place to be able to do it? And of course, you know, they're then the smarty pants that another, you know, so if you're on another board, you say to you, well, in my other board, the CFO is doing and you can see the look of terror across their face thinking oh <laughs> god no I'm going to have to do that I mean that's the sort of human reality of it isn't it um, and I ha- I mean I think almost all the chairs I know um, and, and, and rate we all have a huge empathy with the the CFO role it's incredibly demanding um, incredibly difficult and um, uh, you know increasingly demanding and difficult uh, I think, but actually, I think this stuff is slightly more enjoyable in some ways. Well, I always, I always have the discussion about, you know, why did you get in? Most, most people that have decided to become a CFO didn't do it because they liked the, you know, playing with, you know, spreadsheets and and graph. That what they're interested in is, is the 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 reason that they're playing with those spreadsheets and graphs. So actually, it, it's it's quite an, it's getting away, isn't it, from the from the um, the the controller of the purse strings into somebody that's helping with more of the strategic direction, which must be very exciting. It must be very exciting. Although I would say, Hannah, there are some people who just like playing with spreadsheets. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Look, right, as a data geek myself, like I enjoy the data, but I'm a bit, I I like to think I'm on that side of the fence. I enjoy understanding what the data is telling me than necessarily build, building uh, really powerful pivot tables. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, no, you're right. There are, there are, and I think that's a decision point, isn't it? What What is the role that you want in finance? You know, do you want to be the person that makes sure everything lines up to the penny? Or do you want to be the person that's involved in, the, like you say, these strategic decisions? And you can be both. And, and interesting, I think in this sort of world, I'm sort of, and we have been talking about, I think the CFO is a more natural partner to the CEO rather than a servant to the CEO. So I think it increases the influence of the CFO as long as you can do it. Um, uh, so I think that's an interesting thing too. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point to ponder on. And I, and I guess my final question for you is how if um, how does a CFO that is looking to maybe go the other way to influence their board into shifting? Because they know it's the right way to go, but perhaps their board is perhaps not quite comfortable with the idea of more dynamic way of working. What are your top tips for them to influence the other way? How could they approach it? So I think if you can give them examples of something that they can relate to where it's worked really well, that's helpful. If you can almost start in baby steps, that's helpful. So you don't have to do the whole thing that way. You could look at one aspect that way. Um, And uh, I think there's also, they're influenced by their peers. They're influenced by, you know, well, if... um, if other people are doing it, why are they doing it? Is this some sort of rash trend that's going to disappear quite quickly? Or is this actually a more profound shift? Also, they may actually be able to demonstrate that they've been doing some aspects of this for a while anyway. This is just actually taking it to the next level. So I think if they think in phases, as opposed to let's go and do it that way. So let's have a phase where we pilot it. We try it. You can have an annual budget, but let's try this as well. And then, and, and so you've got it alongside the annual budget because you, you probably will, you know, if you're a public company, you're going to need to make forecasts and all the rest of it. So, you, you know, you have to have that. But, but I think this, this alongside it may be to start with so that people feel they're not ditching the things that they've got very comfortable with and, um, you know, um, and, and like to operate by because if you've been operating for 30 years by one approach and you suddenly say well let's let's chuck that away and let's do something different i think naturally people are going to be suspicious and worried so you have to give confidence build confidence as you go through it and do you think this will do away with that annual budget rush that happens sort of three months before the um the year ends do you think it will continue and be more um continuous through the the year and the cycle or do you think you will always have that um that push for planning pre pre pre-financial year i i think if you if you report in financial years which people will probably do then you're going to have to have some idea in advance you're going to have to have a forecast for that year and you're probably going to have a related sort of what you're likely to spend for that year but what I'm saying is alongside that, um, you're going to, within the year, adopt a more dynamic approach. And actually, it works because earlier on, you might be signaling up, as many public companies do, you know, we are not going to hit our forecast or we're going to achieve the same profit, but in a different way. So I think it supports rather than um, replaces, if you like, completely. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Patrick. It's been a really interesting, um, a really interesting session, I think, and crossed a lot of topics in terms of both, obviously, influence on both sides, boards influencing CFOs and CFOs influencing boards potentially as well. And also, I guess, a heads up for a lot of CFOs that that this is something that boards are going to be asking for more and more. And and I'm, I think I might just finish on that question to yourself, is that in the boards that you're working with, how prevalent is this trend? Is it in and it's it now expected? Or is it something that is coming in and becoming more of a trend? Very variable. So, uh, but if you, if you want a view of sort of what's happening across the UK I'd say it's coming in and it's starting to happen much more significantly rather than it's there yet but some people are much you know there are early adopters and everything aren't there and they, they've they've learned a lot and, and you know uh, a lot of us can benefit from the learnings that they've had um, but I suspect you know most of the accounting firms consulting firms will be seeing this as an opportunity as well to um, to, to change thinking on a few things. And so I suspect, you know, in the the early part of next year, there'll be quite a lot coming out of the the, the accounting profession, particularly around, um, you know, 
how you might do, how you might implement such a change. Exciting times, hey. And, you know, certainly um, I'm, I'm seeing an echo of what you're talking about in, in my, my day-to-day life and certainly the conversations I'm having with CFOs. So it's, it's great to understand where it's coming from because I, I, I did, what I find fascinating is the, the preparation for the unknown, which is the question, which was always um, an interesting piece, isn't it? In terms of that they're, they're, they're being asked to, to, to prep for things that they don't actually know what is coming. Um, and certainly the, the conversations I have around reporting and analytics is that I don't know what I don't know and I don't know what I'm going to need, but I need to know that I have the framework in place to be able to analyze it. So so thank you again, Patrick. Some amazing food for thought for all of our CFOs out there. And and, and I'm, I love your analogy of um, the maps to SatNav worlds, you know, incorporating both the change in process and also the technology as well. So what a great metaphor. So for those that are listening and that are interested in exploring or learning more about Patrick, we will pop again the link to his LinkedIn in in the um, show notes. I will also put a link to the article if you get a chance to read it. It's a great article and sums up a lot of the conversation. And I think it's even got that three minute video that you talked about in in there, hasn't it, Patrick? Yeah, done in my car. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can admire Patrick's uh, uh, driving skills or you know his his, his car. Um, while he talks through the concept so thank you again Patrick wonderful to have you back on the show and again you know some great food for thought for anybody listening absolutely my pleasure and, and just to clarify I wasn't driving while I recorded it <laughs> <laughs> yeah safety first safety first <laughs> thanks again thanks very much <laughs>